the evidence of where our people came from, from Egypt to Mount Sinai and the crossing to the Red Sea, it's extremely important to us. And, you know, it doesn't matter who discovers that as far as whether it be Jew or Gentile, the fact is that that can be documented because there's so much argument whether or not our people really were in bondage in Egypt. Many of the uh, Egyptologists or the archaeologists, they argue, they say, well, we can prove from Solomon's time, David's time, but when it comes to were the Jews ever really in Egypt or not, there's still a lot of debate over that. I mean, it was probably David Roll that uh, in, in his book um, uh, that he wrote, Pharaohs and Kings, that brought more of a chronology from an Egyptologist side that begin to help archaeologists find the remnants back in Egypt. But it was a, a God-gifted man by the name of Ron Wyatt that discovered Mount Sinai and where it was in Saudi Arabia. And, 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 and Josephus, uh, the Jewish historian, you know, always pointed it out as well that it was in that area. Um, and I, I, if I'm not mistaken, Sir Isaac Newton as well made mention that the mountain of God had to be in northwest Saudi Arabia. Uh, so, you know, when we begin to look at this evidence and then God takes someone like Ron to find these things, you know, it's a sigh of relief for the Jewish people to know that this is, this is part of our history. You know, our Bible is not a fanciful tale as some archaeologists have tried to make it out to, say, to be. The, the Bible itself, the Word of God, whether you're Jewish and you believe the Tanakh or the Torah to be your Bible, or if you're a Christian, the Christian Bible, which is just a furtherment by Jewish writers as well, you know, so it's still all conclusive, it's still a Bible. And that's something that... I met Ron in 1988, and at that time he had already made most of the major discoveries that, that he had, had made, and he just needed help. He had done all of this work and then was working to support himself and all of that. So I came along at a time where I was in the same position as people like yourself, like Vivica, because I got to hear him walk into my office one day because he had heard that there were some people in a friend of his office who wanted to hear about Noah's Ark. And this was, in 88, nobody had videos and things like that. So he walked in and he started talking to just a handful of us. And what he talked about there was the first time in my life that I'd ever heard anyone talk about Jesus Christ like a real person. Mm -hmm. He sounded like he was his friend. But the subject of Mount Sinai was one that was very, very close to his heart because he had, in this day and age, we don't think so much of it. Like Vivica was able to get a job and go over there, but in 1983, uh, let's see, yeah, in 1983, when Ron went over there for the first time, after he had found the chariot wheels in the Gulf in 1978, and uh, he had applied to to the Saudi Embassy in D.C. for many years to try to get a visa over there, and he was always refused. And uh, he wasn't, uh, you know, a very well-connected type person, so he couldn't get over there, you know. He just wanted to go over there. He, uh, I gave you a copy of the, uh, an excerpt, a, a chapter from a book by Rennie Norbergen, and in this book, Norber Mr. Norbergen happened to go with Ron there in 1978 where uh, Ron showed him where he had found chariot remains um, in the sea and he told him that he had, you know, prayed about it and, and was absolutely convicted that this Jabal El Laws range had to be where Mount Sinai was mm -hmm. based on the biblical account. And so when he and his two sons, who were just, one was a teenager, one was just barely not a teenager, they were uh, taken prisoner by the, the Saudi uh, Coast Guard, that's who patrols that area. 
when uh, they slipped across the Jordanian border and got down to the mountain. And Ron saw it and he knew that was it. He saw the, um, he saw the golden calf altar mm -hmm. at that time. He saw the, what he called the holy precinct area and he saw uh, the altar back there. Mm -hmm. And he, they were leaving and thought they would be able to get out of the country when they were arrested. Now, the reason they were arrested is because a certain person had called the, called the Saudi embassy and told them that the Wyatts were Israeli spies. And, um, I remember reading about that yeah. before. So it was a very, very, very serious thing. Mm -hmm. And they were imprisoned. Ron talked about it. He never would say anything bad about his captors. He said there were some there that were very kind to them. One in particular that they were very fond of and didn't want anything to happen to. So right. that's why they didn't, wouldn't really try to escape. But um, they confiscated all his photos, you know. And so he came out empty handed. I know there's so much that you discovered at Jabal El Az, mm -hmm. but when it comes to that Red Sea crossing, God had to have a second witness there. Yeah. And because he knows how Israel is. I mean, we're a people that are still uh, bound by that law. I think about, when I think of that, I, I can't help, this is kind of just comes to my mind. I think of when Elijah, God tells Elijah to go and he'd find this man called Elisha. And when he would find Elisha, uh, he would be the one that would take his place. He would be in his room, as, a, as, a, as a, I think is how it's written in the Christian Bible. But in other words, he would take his place. He was going to take yes. his place in the future. Yes. And Elisha is plowing behind 12 yoke of oxen. Mm -hmm. And I've always believed that that is a type of the spirit of Elijah or the Elijah that will come in modern days that Israel is looking for. And when he comes in that sense, he will find Israel still yoked, the 12 tribes of Israel yoked under the bondage of the law. Mm -hmm. But it is this Elisha that will loose that bondage for them and take that law out. But that saying, the whole point is though, is when you're looking at two being a witness, Ron Wyatt being the first witness, that God used to verify that the children of Israel have actually crossed this place yes. indeed. And then God turns right back around and he brings you in as a second witness. And you know, I've never thought about it. Vivka, like but you know what's even more special about that? Who was the first person to witness the resurrection? Women. It was a woman, it was Mary. First one to witness that. Why God does that. And when, when she goes and tells his disciples, because he tells them, go tell my disciples I've risen. Mm -hmm. And she goes and she tells them, and they didn't believe her because she's a woman. Yeah. And he abraded them later for doing that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, God is, I like to say he's got a sense of humor. You know, <laughs> so, you know, here, I mean, truly, you know, they, they would say, well, he's a man. He, he discovered it. Praise God for that. But then he yeah. takes that second witness to be a woman and is so perfect in line for the way God does, because in the first hand, under, under the law, men from their nature have tried to rule. But when Christ came, when Jesus himself come on the scene, we find that God takes, and there's, um, things are put back in the order the way they should be, at least in principle, because the Spirit of God now comes upon the people. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, God takes both man and woman to to be a witness. So I never nice thought thing. about it like that, you know. Uh, the reason I went in was actually to be able to be a witness to what I saw in Saudi Arabia. Now, was your desire to go to uh, to the Gulf of Aqaba first, to to the site there? Yes. Or okay. Because well, both. But I I read in the Bible. Uh, it said that Israel saw the Egyptians die, uh, lying dead on the seashore. And when I read that, I realized that there must be some stuff lying in that water right there on the beach as well. You know, there has never been civilization there as far as I know. Right. But on the Nueva side was where Ron had been diving and found uh, horses' hooves and skeleton parts and chariot wheels and I thought there must be something on the other side so I asked Ron 
did you ever get to dive on the Saudi side? And he said, no, you know, because they were taken. And they, I don't think they had the equipment either with them to be able to do it. The thing that I always thought was fascinating too is when you told me before we were talking about uh, Ron had let you borrow his uh, underwater camera equipment yeah. and he told you just film because you were getting frustrated, you hadn't found anything yet, and he said just film. Mm -hmm. And that's when I remembered um, so what Ron told me to do. So I thought why don't I just do what Ron told you to do. Ron said don't bother what you see, just turn the camera on and film. And so I did that. And that's when all these artifacts came into picture. I mm. think that's awesome. That is incredible. <laughs> so when did when did you go to Mount Sinai? And I know that one thing that I love on your testimony is um, the cave of Elijah and the split rocks. Mm. That especially getting to see the pictures. I mean, um, that's something you'll have yes, to reveal when you write your book or memoir, however you're going to put this together, yeah, but I mean, that I mean, is I mean, incredible. Um, so coming into close beneath the cave there and looking around at the precinct, I would see huge boulders that were split, like as if somebody had cut them in two with a sharp knife, but there were no marks of tools on them as far as I could see. Seeing the, I, pic seeing the pictures are just incredible. Yeah, incredible. I saw several of those and even when we had this seminar in Oregon now uh, this past weekend, I found more of them on the pictures that I have done. Also even wow. on the golden calf altar there, there are pictures of split rocks. Anyway. I, I, I had to pray my way, I had to ask God all the time, you know, what is this and why is this, you know, and, and that's when I start, I remembered 1 Kings 19 when Elijah walked from uh, Israel and down to Mount Horeb, 40 yes. days and 40 nights, and how he came into a cave and and it said that he came to Mount Horeb, and I, as I studied along, I found that Mount Sinai and Mount Horeb are, it's the same mountain it's talking about, because as Moses is recapitulating in Deuteronomy 9, he, uh, you can tell it's the same events. Of course, when we look at Josephus and the writings that we have from him putting the mountain of God in northwest Saudi Arabia, and then Paul going into to Arabia uh, for three years, it seems really no doubt or no question it was a holy site for the, the Jewish people. And then of course when you find where Ron uh, discovers the, the pillar um, and in, in the sand on the Egyptian side, and then uh, later we find that the, the pillar that's on the Saudi side, and if I remember correctly, I may be wrong on this, uh, there are the ancient Hebrew hieroglyphics on that one, where you can see the name of Solomon, uh, the, the name of Yahweh or Yahweh, however yeah. people might want to say that. Um, but it, it shows that undoubtedly Solomon must have had these pillars erected as a monument, as a testimony yes. where the children of Israel crossed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Paul, they had to have known where the mountain of God was, and it's just been lost over time.